Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our very first in-person Thailand event after a few years of break. Um, and this we are being hosted by the Sydney Southeast Asia Center. And I'll first start with the welcome, acknowledgement of country. Before we begin today's event, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. We pay our respects to those who have care and continue to care for country. So as I mentioned, um, we do have a very vibrant um, community of uh, researchers, students, and the public who are engaged with contemporary and historical Thailand issues. And we're really proud to let you know that as a center, um, we have actually grown in the membership of the number of researchers who have studied Thailand. When I first joined in 2015, we have about you know 70-ish uh, researchers. Now we have nearly 300. So it's a, one of the uh, most dynamic and fast growing growing places in the world that actually support Thailand research. So we are so happy to be able to host this first event today um, that discusses a really important event that just took place weeks ago, which is the Thailand national election. Uh, so today we have Michael Ruffles from the Sydney Morning Herald, who's going to serve as a moderator of the event. We have to my left here, uh, Prof uh, Professor Greg Reno from Australian National University. And then we have Professor Pawin Chachawan Pongpan from the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Kyoto University. And then we have Ganyanat Kalfajianis from the Australian Alliance for Thai Democracy. And I'll also be joining as well. I'm the Thailand Country Coordinator for the Sydney Southeast Asia Center. So I'll pass the mic on to Michael for our event to begin. Um, good evening and welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight on this beautifully warm, sunny Sydney day. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we're at the bar and we should, each have a, we should each have a beverage in front of us for this discussion. Nearly a month has passed since Thailand went to the polls. And while the results were emphatic, uh, it remains to be seen when a new government will form and what shape it will take. The election was the second since the coup of 2014. And and the second since the 2016, uh, 17 constitution, which ushered in tighter, tighter rules for the military control of the country. It was also the second since uh, the ascension of King Maha Wajiralongkorn to the throne, and the first since a series of protests took aim at the king and his role in politics. The turnout was quite strong, with 75% of eligible voters making their voices heard. The Move Forward Party emerged which emerged after the Future Forward Party was dissolved in 2020, secured 151 seats. Now, there's a recount underway for 47 seats, so the exact result is still up in the air. Uh, led by Peter Lim Jerome Rat, the upstart opposition secured 14.4 million votes on the party list alone uh, and caused an orange wave across the country. Most striking was its success in Bangkok, where the party secured 32 out of 33 seats. Second was Pertai, the political machine of exiled former PM and controversial tycoon Thaksin Shinawat, with 141 seats. Again, with that asterisk of there's a recount underway. Second is an unusual place for Thaksin and his family members and allies. Until now, they have won every election they have competed in in this century. Still, with 11 million votes, Pertai has also expanded its presence in parliament and has five more seats than in the last parliament. With the exception of Pum Jai Thai growing in size, it was a bad result for the incumbent government, the now caretaker government. Priyut Janocha, the former army chief who led the 2014 coup, remains the caretaker prime minister for now, but it seems only a matter of time before parliament sits to choose his replacement. His former brother-in-arms, Prawit Wongsuan, and his Palang Pracharat party fared a little better. So, Move Forward and Pertai have joined with six other par parties to form a coalition intent on being the new government when all the ballots are ratified. But as lim limbo lingers, a number of questions hang over Thailand. The biggest, of course, is whether Move Forward and its coalition allies can actually form a government. Team Peter has ridden a wave of popularity 
but there are challenges to the validity of his candidacy because of inherited shares in ITV, which has been out of business since 2007. Having a thumping majority in the 500 seat lower house is also not enough to secure the prime ministerial position as there are 250 installed senators and they also get a vote. The magic number to be the prime minister is 376. So how will they vote is another question. Also gnawing away at the edges is the place of the monarchy. Move Forward advocates for reform of the Leech Majesty Royal Defamation Law and none of its coalition allies do. Many of Move Forward's opponents also say that this is, even asking for reform is unacceptable. Some going so far as to say that even suggesting reform is tantamount to attempting to overthrow the system. So was this election a case of democracy versus autocracy? Was it young versus old? Was it hope and change versus a conservative establishment trying to maintain power? And how much does this election change how we view democracy in Thailand? Is that old idea of rural red Tuxanites versus yellow urban elites over? Um, so these questions should hopefully make tonight quite a lively discussion. And first I'd like to pass to Pawin and ask him, do you think Move Forward has a chance of forming a viable government? Uh, okay, me first. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you know, for I sleep. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, based on the result, you know, I mean, this party and then Pita himself has legitimacy to form government. And I think uh, the guy and also the party move uh, toward that direction quite quickly. And again, I think that is a, a very good uh, strategy for Pita to sort of immediately call up you know, other, other party to sort of form a kind of coalition government. And then uh, he started to talk about, you know, uh, what kind of government he would like to have, you know, uh, for the next four years. Uh, but as time has gone by, you know, at the beginning, I, I, I was a little bit more hopeful, uh, believing that uh, the, 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 the Thai old elite, you know, would learn their lesson and, you know, would uh, at last, you know, respect the result of the election or basically the people's mandate, right? But then the the, 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 the delay, and we don't know how long this is going to be delayed, right? I mean, it could be up to two months. We have to wait for the, uh, the, 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 the final word from the election commission. And we already have really heard about, you know, that could be a sort of uh, re-election, you know, coming up. So, I mean, the, you can't see it apart from... You know, uh, this is a kind of tactic of trying to delay Pita, you know, uh, toward uh, the premiership. And, and I think, as I said, you know, at the beginning, I thought that I would be more hopeful. Now I'm a little bit less hopeful. Uh, and the longer it, 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 it becomes delayed, you know, uh, it would not be helpful or beneficial for Pita and his party. Uh. Greg, I'll bring you in here. As our resident expert on the Thai military, you also promised to be something of uh, Anthony Green for tonight. Um, how significant was it that Prawit, Wong Suan and Priyut Janoja had a bit of a split and falling out before the election? Did that play into how, how the election panned out? I think the um, Prawit, Priyut uh, split is um, in some ways vindicates uh, people who've always predicted that military proxy parties in Thailand tend to uh, crash and burn. Um, obviously, uh, Palam Pracharat didn't do that at 2019 uh, election, which surprised people. Uh, this time around, it seems like uh, they've done just that. Um, it seems like the lack of any really unifying platform ideology philosophy other than keeping progressives out of power um, meant that they really were very subject to personal animosities and rivalries. So uh, it's well understood that um, Briut uh, wanted to control the party. Briut didn't like that. There were fallouts over one particular individual, Tama. Um, My friend Tamanat. Tamanat, your friend Tamanat, of course. <laughs> 
So yeah, I, I think that I think that split was damaging for them, but I also think there were bigger factors at work, and you know, I think um, uh, we're getting further away from the. Uh, both the royal transition and the 2014 coup, and I think people started to feel bolder about choosing something that they really wanted, whereas in 2019, I think they just thought they would go for what they might be able to get, and that was some form of stability. Uh, you know, there's, there's some good survey work that's been done about how people voted in Piao, and it was very much about, well, I would like to vote Pua Thai, but I'm going to vote Palam Pracharat because, you know, I don't want to see the colour wars come back. This time it seemed like people really um, voted with their hearts um, to a large extent. So, can you know, um, there's been a lot of talk about the youth vote for Move Forward and the youth protest movement making its voice heard. Is this a generational change on display or are there other forces at play here? I, I believe that um, a lot of us for this vote, um, this election 2023, many of us is the first time or maybe second time, uh, the second time voters. But I think the youth movement has um, a lot of influence on the um, the outcome of this election this time. Many of us, uh, I think generally the younger generations everywhere just essentially the same that we don't really pay attention to politics as long as it doesn't affect us. But in Thailand, the, the political climate has really, really affected us the past, I think, since the coup 2014. Me personally, it was right up next to my university back when I was studying. So even if you wanted to avoid them, it's right there. And it, since it's been happening every almost single month, and all of, the, um, I would say, the whole, the witchful thinking, the things that they've been telling us that the coup was necessary. And they came in temporary to, um, to, to reform, but we haven't seen any reform at all. And the worst is that the people been dying uh, when we see other, we've been dying for elections, and we never have proper elections. The last election not even real. So this time, the, the, the youth, the younger generations, wanted our voice to be heard. That's why the number turns out. You can see that even in the south, it's orange. So it's move forward party. It speaks the volume that this is the consensus of us, this generation. So. Um, this is not about generation gap. This is not about um, um, the red shirt versus yellow shirt anymore. This is about change. And this is our generation speaking for what we wanted to see. And we we done, we, we so fed up with the old political maneuvering. We don't want that tactics anymore. So um, if they're gonna do the same thing, the same trick again, then we're gonna see the number turn out that might be something we never seen before. Uh, and Can I say something as a Gen Xer? <laughs> So that would put me in the sort of young category, right? So that's a young, young, and what are we? Not so young. No, not <laughs> that you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the, the the most interesting thing about this election is not whether we want change or no change, but what kind of change, right? And it's and it's so startling to see the constituencies that were red turn orange. Because you thought, well, red was change, but so is orange. So what change do we want? And I think the fundamental difference between Pur Thai and uh, Move Forward is that Move Forward clearly is about structural transformation, whereas Pur Thai is change within the bounds of the existing system. And because Pur Thai has always been electorally successful because of their quote unquote, you know, populist um, welfare oriented policies. Now, if you look at all the economic policies of most of the major parties, they're all very similar. So it, in some way, Pur Thai lost that identity where it stood out, you know, and I think the biggest defeat story here is actually Pur Thai. And they cannot be happy to be playing second fiddle. No, uh, and we've already started to see grassroots mobilization of some of the, the red shirts um, who are basically campaigning for their party to defect from the uh, MFP-led coalition. What are some of the scenarios that you can see playing out in the months ahead? Scenario? 
Pitas out, right? I think Ajahn Wynn was telling me about it. What, what did you tell me about it? I didn't want to take credit for what you told me half an hour ago. Yeah. Pitas out, and then? Then the, the, there might be a possibility of Pirtai coming in. Because it's just, it just so funny that, you know, from the viewpoint, I mean, if that would be the palace when we're going up there, you know, pulling the string, perhaps maybe Pirtai would be more acceptable. Oh, we have we have any we have any branches. Uh, well, I mean, come on, Pure Thai, you know, they they want to understand, of course, you know, with toxins as sort of, you know, as a head figure head, right? Uh, yeah, I, I I think that that could be one 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 option, you know, if you if you basically just wish to Pure Thai, uh, because I mean, toxin has made had had been had his made this position very clear uh, prior to the election that, you know, he just want to reconcile with the parliament than anything. He, you know, I mean, in fact, a few days before the election, he even tweeted that, you know, he just want to go home, you know, he just want to go back and then look after his children. You know, he'd been away f f from home so long. Uh, you know, can you please give me permission? And then he referred to the king as his boss. So. I thought I thought that was not a wise, you know, move. No, I was say, did, did that gain votes for him or lose votes for I him? I think I think lose more than anything because I think that this is such a ploy, and I, I like to say that it's such a cheap ploy, you know, for you know, in order to urge the sport supporter of Pure Thai to vote for the party so that he could come home. So I mean, that, that is the that is fine line between you know what would what supposed to be the interest of the party and the interest of Pakistan. Yeah, you can't you can't distinguish you know uh, between the two, and it has always been you know taxing a uh, game anyway. You know to use uh, the pure Thai as his own uh, vehicle to, to achieve you know his personal interest. So because because of this, I think that's why Gao Gai sort of offers something new, you know, to, to the water. And I mean, if you, if you look at a tweet on that day when you refer to the king as boss, in fact, a lot of people you know in the young generation even argue that no. We basically are your boss because we the people and you as politicians, you know, supposed to serve the people and no one else, right? Can you not, have you noticed from overseas uh, the so there was a huge overseas turnout for this election? Do you, have you noticed more political engagement than in the past for this election? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think in the past. Because um, the generations that came before, they became more influential, more influential. Especially, you can see the example in Sydney. There was a saying that said, Sydney is a city of uh, royalists. Sydney was <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> so, um, and, and those people in power, they were, you know, business owners. So the younger generations or anybody that have different opinions, they were scared of um, showing, even expressing their opinions. So we censored ourselves, even if we're living overseas. But I believe that the youth movement uh, back in 2020 and from uh, from that point onward has been um, uh, has, has has been a very um, great influence uh, on uh, encouraging people to speak speak up. And but even even that point, it was quite um, it's still somewhat something that we need to trade. Some people call, see my group, uh, the Australian Alliance for Thai Democracy, that we'd have some protests in the city. They see our group as some somewhat bravery, that, it, that we were brave to come out. But which is, for me, is quite shocking because we, we're not brave. It was just something that should be, um, she shouldn't be called bravery. Something that we stand for what we think it doesn't need to be brave to do that, but for the Thai, they're afraid to be seen as political if they have to choose side, and they were scared of repercussions if they take sides. And um, but, but for now, um, I think people fed up with, so most of the people behind the keyboard, so the social media has influence on us. We following uh, closely to what's happening in Thailand, and uh, in, even though we still, some of us still scared of joining the movement, they support in other way, back on social media or um, support in other in other types. And then, um, so when once the election came in, um, I was 
for me, I was trying my best to promote um, uh, the uh, the campaign uh, in, um, encouraging people to come to come out to vote. Uh, what I see is that um, there was some myth saying that the Thai authority overseas working were working for dictatorship and working against the people. For this election, this is the first time that I voted um, outside Thailand. I totally disagree with this myth. Um, I see that the, the royal consulate, uh, they've, they've been accommodating the people as, as best as they can. And um, for this time, I think this is the first time that we have the voting by post. We never had it before. So um, we can vote in person and vote in post. This is why this time Sydney has been number one turnout of all the voting outside Thailand. Well, in a, so I, I'm not sure if I can take credit for it, but we've been very vocal that we, that to, towards uh, the, Thai, the Royal Consulate uh, in, in Sydney. And I, be, I, feel, I feel like they've been um, acting that, the way they're supposed to do. While in other countries like in New York or in, other, in the US especially, um, the Royal Consulate somewhat suspicious they even refused the bullets that were sent on time, and they refused those bullets. So uh, for the overseas movement, in my opinion, we, um, to the Thai citizens, we need to be active citizens. We need to keep watch of what they are doing. They, that, <laughs> this is something that um, the, the authority is supposed to do what they're supposed to do, but they don't do what they're supposed to do. So us as a citizen need to, to point out, to call out if we see anything ir irregularities. Sorry, since, since we said nice thing about the consulate, <laughs> the consulate in Sydney, maybe you should consider uh, sponsor your program. <laughs> no, <laughs> if, should there be representative of the consulate here? No, I'm serious about it. Right, this is a part of, of you know responsibility of, of Thai diplomatic mission overseas, which I used to become one of them. <laughs> I told them about this event. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, we've obviously heard about potential electoral interference, and there's a recount underway. There's opportunity for judicial interference. What about the army? Is the army going to come out of the barracks again, Greg? Yeah, that's always um, the big question everyone wants to know about. I think talking about scenario planning, I think, you know, it's really interesting. Um, the Army Chiefs apparently have been meeting the last few days to game out uh, what the scenarios might be like in July. And I think overall, you know, you'd have to say that Thailand, uh, the conservative side's getting better at what they do, which is keeping democracy at bay. Um, designing the 2017 constitution in itself is a pretty sophisticated way of looking like uh, Thailand's democratic, keeping the eyes of the world off Thailand. Uh, at many people in, after the, after the uh, election uh, a month ago believe that Thailand's transitioned now to, you know, a wonderful democratic government. And, and understandably, um, there's lots of ways in which the, the system, the conservative side, uh, look at how they can mimic democracy but not do democracy. But on the other hand, you know, <laughs> Pitta is also pretty good at scenario planning. And anyone who's been uh, reading about him recently, he's quite a fascinating character. He's, he's a politics junkie, has been since a child. Um, peace in the Nikkei, he was watching elections on TV when he was young. He was on Obama's, uh, worked in Obama's campaign in the US. Um, an inter interview he did recently with Jonathan Head, which I really recommend, he talks about having a 10-day plan, a 100-day plan, a year plan, a five-year plan. I think he is quite prepared to let this election go, in fact, uh, and be around for the long game. He probably knows that if Pua Thai chooses to go into coalition with the military, with the military proxy parties, they may be consigning themselves to the dustbin. I mean, we've seen the Democrats, you know, if you look back as uh, late as 2005, they were the second largest party, and now they are almost about to disappear. 
um, poor Thai, I think, might be facing the same decline if, if they diminish their credibility by going into coalition. And, um, you know, Pita will be ready for that. So it's, it's a really interesting um, situation. I think the army, they also have their own predicament. The, the reports are that uh, the army vote around particular bases was very strongly orange. So whether or not they could command the absolute loyalty that you need to conduct a coup is a really interesting question. You know, historically, the Thai military has, off, ha has split from time to time, most famously in 1973. Could those conditions arise again? The military planners of any coup will have to be very sure. It's a dangerous game to attempt a coup when you don't have everything lined up. So, yeah, I, I, but to come back to that point about scenario planning, the Conservatives had so many other levers at their disposal these days that a coup is something that they won't be looking at. It'll be the, the, the fifth, sixth, seventh option that they choose. There are so many others uh, that, that they have to remove um, the de democratic side. And one is built in, the Senate. And could you tell us a little bit about the Senate? What who, who's in it? I mean, there's 20, 250 people. And we kind of assume, oh, well, they're all junta appointed, therefore yeah. they're all the same. Could you tell us a bit and inform us a bit more about that? They're not. I mean, yes, technically speaking, it's a body that was designed to protect, well, to provide checks and balances against um, executive power, right? It was just a scare from Thaksin's time when he just came on and just basically appear as if he's running a company where he's the CEO of a nation, therefore, he's calling the shots and those institutions were put in place by the military to protect the the political establishment interests but also to provide checks and balance against executive aggrandizement but um i think it's important to know that senators are not the military some of them actually are uh, but they uh, have free will as well and i think one issue, and I've told Michael this, that's not often talked about in the media, is how much senators really don't like MFP MPs. If you watch any debates at all, or parliament sitting, joint sitting, they are going at it like in, you know, in, in joint sitting, they're telling each other to go to die on record. Right, all the time, the verbal abuse between Gao Gai um, um, party and senators were crazy. To be honest, like even I listen to sometimes, like this was said in joint sitting. It's unbelievable. As one senator said, we don't have to like the military to vote against Pita. And I think that's important. People think somehow that senators lack free will, that they are just, uh, you know, mindless agents of the military. They're not. Some of them that are military officers, yes, and they've already come out and said that they're going to abstain, which is already a decision. But I also think that the, the over the years, the animosity between MFP um, MPs in particular and senators are vicious, ongoing. They hate each other. Really, and the much of that verbal abuse is like often also quite generational in terms of narratives. It's like you should go die, shouldn't you be in coffins already? Oh well, young people can die too, like this in Parliament. So I think the roots of the discontent of senators towards these progressive voices are much deeper than just. Oh, well, they got to their position because they work for the junta. Um, so, so what does being a conservative mean and what does being a progressive mean in Thailand today then? If we've got, it, is it the same as what we think of in the West with, uh, you know, uh, oh, well, okay, on top of my head, I think in fact we've had this discussion before uh, this event. Uh, I think it would be obsolete today to talk, to look at, to define Thai politics as, as sort of color-coded politics. Remember 10 years ago, yeah, we talked about yellow, you know, who, who would be yellow and who would, who would be red. You know, it, it gets to the point that you have to be so careful what color of your shirt, you know, 
to, to wear in the morning so that you know, wearing red today? <laughs> no pink. <pain. laughs> pink is, is, is this color of new generation. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, but, but, but today it, it would be, as I said, it would be a bit out of fashion to look at Thailand the same as a, a kind of, you know, being characterized as the, 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 uh, the, the conflict between the red and, and the yellow. I think uh, the, we have come to sort of the, the shift in how we redefine Thai politics, especially during uh, the royal transition. I would say that today, uh, you, you could say that in the conflict sort of, you could say that the monarchy basically is at the fault line, right? Today, you would talk about, you know, whether you're royalist or you're not. You know, I would, I would cross to the other side to say that either royalist or anti-monarchist because, you know, to accuse someone to be anti-monarchist is, is, is not nice, at least. It, you know. what, what's the agnostic equivalent of, instead of being atheist or anti-theist, you can be... Well, I have to say, whether, whether you're royalist or not, I think that would be enough, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of younger generation would redefine themselves as, yeah, maybe I'm not royal, I'm not royalist. So uh, I, I think this is my understanding of today, when you look at how this is how we should define the current conflict. It's no longer red or yellow. I think one of the really interesting things has been uh, the sort of answers that Tanaton and uh, and Pitar have been giving when they're accused of being extreme. You know, Sutong. Um, they 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 give a really clever answer where they contextualise Thailand in global terms, and they say, "Oh, well, if we're Sutong, then that so is Japan, and so is Britain, because." Their monarchies exist within a legal framework. Their monarchies, uh, you know, um, uh, don't have complete control of their finances. Their monarchies uh, don't have a les majest law to protect them and so on and so forth. So their response is quite interesting. It's actually, you know, to be conservative in Thailand is to be protect protecting a kind of feudal version of monarchy, um, which is you know, not n not the kind of monarchy that um, Ganyanat's generation want anymore, uh, which is fairly clear. But you see, when you compare the Thai case with the British or the Japanese case, right, uh, in, uh, in in this discussion of being Sultong, of course, this you know, would come up, you know, with another kind of argument to say that this is unique for Thailand, right? You know, we, we must not compare ourselves with, you know, monarchies elsewhere, because uh, Thai monarchy has a special place you know, in Thailand. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that the, arg the argument could become endless. Uh, I don't want to hold the microphone completely to myself. Is, has anyone got any questions from the floor? I will start doing my uh, Stan Grant impersonation. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for your your um, thoughts on this um, issue. My name is Tom Burden, and I'm a lecturer, a senior lecturer in international studies and Asian studies at Macquarie University. My work is on queer media in Thailand, um, and I never ever expected myself to find myself looking in, into the question of politics. But as Aim and I have been discussing over many kind of years now, what became really apparent to me was how youth, celebrities who are aligned with youth were really kind of mobilizing their social media platforms around key issues, not necessarily election, the election per se, but for example, within the context of my research, marriage equality, and using that as a kind of way in which to then surreptitiously talk about the need for democratic reform. And I, I remember at the beginning of this conversation, we were discussing what the implications for this are for democracy. And I think that it's very clear amongst young people in Thailand in particular, that there's a desire towards democratization. Um, and I think that that also connects to broader youth movements we've seen throughout Southeast and East Asia, the so-called Milk Tea Alliance, et cetera. So I'd be one, I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear the panel's thoughts on, on this kind of broader shift, particularly amongst young people. Amy mentioned that people are now thinking about what that future and what that change will look like. I wonder if you might have any broader discussions to have around that future and around these desires for human rights, accountability, democratic reform, etc. 
Great, thanks, Tom. So in my research, I look at, you know, one of the things I look at is values that change over time. And it's, you know, going back to Michael's question about what it means to be progressive today in Thailand. And it's really clear the social dimensions have been driving it as well. Like um, the YouGov poll shows last year that support for same-sex marriage is nearly 70% in the country. Um, there has been a steady and continuous increase in support for gender equity in education, in jobs, but as well in political participation. It's actually the high, one of the highest in the region um, where there is more popular support for women in uh, political power. Uh, and there, you know, last year Thailand be became the first country in Asia to legalize cannabis, uh, medical cannabis. Uh, so I think, you know, those social issues have kind of, they're, you know, and a substantial and continuous decline in support for military roles in politics. So it's half. In um, 20, uh, 2006, about 20% support now is less than 10. So that kind of go together, I, I think, paints a really good picture across age groups, that these values have changed, especially increased support on, you know, really, you know, big issues like same-sex marriage and all, and all that. And I think those dimensions have been captured well and quite clearly in the DNA of the MFP, more so than any other party, in terms of it being the driving agenda. Like, Per Thai does come out and support LGBTQ+, and all that, but it isn't clear. It's not what they're known for, and I think MFP did a really good job in conveying that this is the choice if you're progressive on all of these issues and are willing to talk about reforming the monarchy. Everyone else is sort of like, you know, Pum Jai Thai is like really gung ho on cannabis, but nothing else. You know, Per Thai is all good on probably same sex marriage on some parts of it, but not all. There's all these sort of, a lot of the, I think a lot of the other parties kind of get lost in that because, in fact, it's the government, it's the military government and its more conservative side, uh, political parties that have been pushing for same sex um, marriage and also tourism, yeah tourism, gate, um, LGBTQ plus tourism as well for a number of years now. But nobody would have thought that. They're just not, they're not identifying that area of progressiveness to their party and I think they've lost that, right? In, even though they've been working at it. So reflecting back, I think, in terms of campaign success of MFP, is that they were very clear about who they are and they were unwilling to back away from their demands. And that was something, and I kind of mentioned this when I was talking to him earlier, because its predecessor, the Future World Party, had been heavily criticized slash also urged to try to expand its support base to include more of the middle people, like people who are kind of centrist, like they're kind of not sure how far radical they want to go in terms of change, they're realizing some change by toning down um, their demands on really key social progressive issues and the monarchy, and they said no. Because if we do that, we dilute who we are as a party, and we lose our very strong core grassroots support. So they decided as a party they're not going to do that, and it looks like it was a good call. Just want to add, add on what Anne just said. Uh, I mean, for this question, I, 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 I have like three thoughts. Uh, uh, in my head. I think the first one, I have to agree with you that, uh, especially the, the movement for LGBT, the equality, I think this def definitely sort of indicate that this issue specifically need a kind of reform. You know, from looking from the outside, you know, it, it, it just looked like Thailand has sort of, you know, very free LGBT communities, but in fact it's not. You know, when it comes to uh, legal binding, you know, we, we sort of sort of lag behind many other countries. So that is the first thought, basically. Uh, is in, it is in early need, you know, to reform. Second one, it is a symbol that, you know, in Thailand, all things must reform, right? And this is just one of them, right? I mean, we have to talk about the reform of the monarchy, but not just that, reform the army or the judiciary, yeah, the reform of the bureaucracy, all sort of reform. It, 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 it's time that we have to go, sort of, the, the whole thing have to go together all at once. And I think this is such a good time uh, when we raise the issue of uh, LGBT equality. And last one, I think, uh, is it would be more hip these days to just look, look, 
beyond the Thai borders, you know. Right now, the issue of, issue of LGBT same-sex marriage is just so catchy, so trendy. You know, in, I mean, Thailand happens happen to talk about it, and, and the celebration last week, right? You know, all, almost all representatives of all political parties come out to support, you know, pride, uh, gay pride, or whatever, I mean, this, this uh, uh, event. Even with the Democrat Party, which rejected same-sex <laughs> marriage, you know, the, 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 the proposal, came out to support pride. This is just so ironic. <laughs> I just want to add as a younger generation, I think something that um, um, the rise of uh, Clubhouse, which is a social platform that bring about uh, conversations. So in the past, we a lot of us been taught that uh, that we have to tolerate, we have to tolerate, and we we we, we young, we don't we didn't get we. We always young in, in their eyes with lack of experience and we, we don't know anything. We don't know better. So, and uh, Clubhouse provide platform that you can remain anonymous. And a lot of us stay, maybe spend time four or five hours a day, every single day. And you have, so uh, Clubhouse transform conference right, like this. Sometimes it's more um, informational than uh, more informative than than a conference. Um, you know, even like you know the thesis, PhD, or that that kind of conference. So I believe that um, that adds on to uh, that it adds on to um, the awareness of our rights. That if we want change, we we cannot just wait for those dinosaurs to make change for us. We need to. We need to vote for people that understand us, people our age, because they, from the outdated era, they will not understand us. Even a lot of us that our age, a lot of us at our age, but you know, those we call, we label, label them Salim, they will not stand for us. Yeah, that is, this is why, this is why a lot of, uh, I believe this is why it's orange, because Look at me, I'm wearing red. I'm actually supporting Pue uh, Thai, but I, I voted for Move Forward Party because I believe uh, this is our era, this is our time, and Pue Thai is way outdated in a lot of policies. A lot of policies, that especially not just uh, um, gender equality, it's also education, and also even human rights in general. So um, for, for this, I believe that the now the, the Thai community, especially the younger generation, we realize that we've been hypocrite the whole time and we need to stand for ourselves. And we can't wait for you know, those dinosaurs to do anything for us. Just on the question of youth, and I'll just say this quickly because I know we've got other questions. It's nearly, it's come to three years since um, Rung gave her speech at, uh, at uh, Tamasat, uh, Anon Nampa gave their speeches, and the 2020 protests were truly extraordinary in terms of the kind of expression and the kind of ideas that were expressed all across the country, the groups that suddenly emerged uh, that challenged notions of authority uh, in Thailand on, on quite a, in quite a wide-ranging way. And um, all of that sentiment, uh, a lot of us wondered, where did that go? Where did that go when the, when, when the protests uh, dwindled? Well, I think we're seeing where it's come, where it's gone. Anyone else with a question? Uh, just in relation to the long game that you mentioned, Jake, um, what is the legal situation oh. with the Constitution? Uh, with the oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. In relation to the long game that you mentioned as a possibility, what is the legal situation with the power of the Senate to select the Prime Minister? I read somewhere it expires in a year's time. Does this open the possibility of, say, um, a more conservative government being appointed and then in a year's time the whole question reopened without an election or does it have to wait for a, another round? What happens is, yes, the Senate can't vote for the Prime Minister in a joint sitting anymore, but the Senate will still be appointed, uh, which I think is still significant. The method of appointment, though, 
uh, is in a piece of subordinate legislation, which wasn't actually part of what people voted for when they voted for the 2017 constitution, which I kind of find interesting, um, that people didn't really know how that Senate was going to operate in future years. And I started to look through this um, piece of legislation, and it's incredibly complicated how, how they're actually chosen. Um, and I, I think it's still quite opaque. So, but yeah, that's my understanding. No, Aim, yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of um, how would you guys like comment in terms of uh, because I guess like sort of look, focusing on the internal dynamics um, is really important, but equally looking as well at sort of what is also um, driving this sort of tension as well from the outside of Thailand. So, for instance, ever since the coup um, went what happened in Thailand. Um, China has been strengthening its relations um, quite a lot with with, with the previous military administration in China in Thailand, and um, equally the Russians have uh, early this year tried to open up bilateral talks with the Thai government. So, I guess like um, what I'm trying to sort of say is, is there sort of like an element that also has to be looked at in terms of the fight for democracy in Thailand is equally also playing out on the world stage as well, and do you reckon that um, I guess that could have potential implications on how the democracy uh, movement goes forward. Um, I do believe there were a protest uh, recently in, um, in uh, Thailand at, outside the US consulate because uh, there were various people that were believing, pro-monarchists pro who were believing that um, uh, the US was meddling in Thailand's affairs. So I just sort of ask if what your comment on that might be. Thank you. I'll start and then uh, I think Thailand has exemplified the trends which have been global. So there's a uh, political scientists talk about a democratic recession globally uh, that started around 2005 and has continued and particularly in Southeast Asia. And there's, you know, there's, there's a reasonable argument that authoritarian powers um, assist each other, they, they provide each other with legitimacy by recognising each other and sometimes actually actively colluding. And that's not just from the big authoritarian powers, China and Russia, but it's also in the Mekong region. If you look at the, the Mekong Five, they're all authoritarian at the moment and they actively collude. Um, there, are, there are dissidents that disappear um, in, in neighbouring countries. Uh, so, and, 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 you know, more broadly, you know, I would argue that ASEAN's actually plays a kind of cushioning role uh, in terms of being able to, um, you know, allow authoritarianism to, to persist um, and, you know, and become more sophisticated, borrow each other's mechanisms, borrow each other's tools, whether or not that's a tool for registering NGOs or a, a way of stacking um, uh, parliamentary seats in, 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 in liberal constitutions. So all of that learning is going on and it's, it, it's making it tougher for democracy. Well, I mean, China has been a rising power and, and for Thailand and also for its immediate neighbours, it has been undeniable power. So when you like China or not, you can't run away from China. So you better be nice with China. I mean, that has been perception of smaller state, you know, uh, bordering China. I mean, don't, 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 don't mistake this, you know. D this bilateral relationship with Thailand and China not just like blossom under uh, the uh, authoritarian environment in Thailand. You look, look back during the Thaksin period from 2001 to 2006, Thais and Chinese relations had been very good during, during the Thaksin time. Even during, this is what I'm trying to say, even during the, the uh, you know, democratic, so-called democratic uh, period under Thaksin, you know, Thaksin visited China, including, you know, visited, you know, the tomb of his ancestor. So, yeah, just to show this kind of solidarity between the two countries. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, this, what I'm saying is that it's just, it just something that Thailand would, would decide to move even further into the orbit of China. Uh, especially during this time when the United, United States seemed to be drifting away as well. For a long, long time, the U.S. has adopted a kind of interventionist approach 
vis-a-vis -vis Thai, uh, you know, situation. And uh, Thai elite, you know, they were not happy about it. So, and at the same time, as Jan Craig said, you know, with this, with China, for example, they give each other legitimacy, they support one another. Yeah. And this also happened at the same time as what I call the rise of illiberalism uh, sort of started in the region as well. You have uh, Myanmar, you have Thailand, you have Cambodia. You know, slowly these countries sort of come together informally and sort of build up a kind of, again, informal alliance among themselves. And they, they, I mean, this kind of informal alliance, alliance has been very really useful, you know, when it comes to you know, coup in Thailand. Who and Myanmar, you don't have to listen to what other people say. Just our neighbor, you know, agree with you and give you a sort of legitimacy, and that would be enough. To, to flip the question around slightly, uh, with a result this strong and having a coalition form and international media saying, oh, well, the millions of voters have chosen this, does it become embarrassing then to? thwart democracy is there any sense that uh, the institutions the business the business community might say well hang on we've got to go with we've got to go with the flow of the people here is that embarrassment is not in their vocabulary <laughs> <laughs> otherwise we would not have had more than 20 coups just when you think that you know they would have learned that lesson no they would never so that's why i would never under, underestimate their stupidity you know? <laughs> I mean, and, and these people they, they always shoot themselves in the foot yeah, and you're not just talking about Thai elite, even, you know, mem member of royal families. They know that, you know, they can't use less majesty law. The more they use, the more it would damage the institution, that, but they can't use it, right? right. So I, 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 mean, I, I would agree with you that, you know, at a certain point, that they, they should understand that Thailand has to lead with the international community, and Thailand has certain commitment, especially when you call yourself sort of democratic country. But in reality, you know, uh, power struggle in Thailand has con continued to redefine Thai politics. So, I mean, I would not be surprised if they would stop Pita right now, or they would, you know, allow him to sort of set up government, but then shortly there would be something, you know, in the pipeline to try to overthrow uh, Pita government. Just on that, just quickly, I mean, Pitar in that interview with uh, Jonathan Head talked about how he wanted to break monopolies in Thailand. He, he compared the liquor situation in Thailand with Japan. You know, um, Thailand and Japan have about the same number of uh, alcohol consumers, but for the same size market, um, Japan has thousands of liquor producers and Thailand has four. Uh, so he wants to change that. Um, I think those oligarchs will be quite concerned, particularly CP, uh, who've been able to uh, extend their tentacles into every every domain, including now mobile phones, um, uh, transport infrastructure, and they started an agribusiness and they show no sign of stopping. So um, I don't think that they will relish the idea of a Pita Lingeron um, move forward party government at all. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, Gustavo Mendelazzo from Curtis, so it's a long way to get here. Um, one of the things that Ajahn Pao, when you mentioned earlier about the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, what I'm wondering is, do you think perhaps in the face of maybe a more democratic government, potentially, uh, I think we are quite pessimistic here, especially the panel about that, but do you think there is potential for change within Thailand's foreign policy strategy moving forward. Again, we had this discussion earlier with AM. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a pity that foreign policy has not been a part of election campaign. Somehow, the issue is not sexy enough. You know, I mean, uh, and this is so ironic. Again, you know, con considering Thailand as a medium-sized country uh, with a lot of role to play, you know, on mainland Southeast Asia. But yet again, we never talk about foreign policy during election campaign. Uh, Okay, then, uh, then whether Thailand has foreign policy, at least in the past two decades, you know, that, is, that, is, that is debatable. You know, it could become a topic of a dissertation for creation where Thailand has really had, had foreign policy since the start passing period. I would argue that no, we do not have it. Because I think successive government have been very busy in defending themselves and then basically held foreign policy hostage, right? So in other words, you know, uh, the foreign, Thai foreign ministry had to continue to defend those in power all the time. 
even when it would go against the principle of the of the foreign ministry itself. So I mean, this is heartbreaking, you know. I mean, as a former member of, of the uh, diplomatic service in Thailand, lastly, there could be uh, some kind of change, but I don't know whether I would be too hopeful or not. Because Peter almost immediately after the election, he gave a lengthy interview on uh, foreign policy, and he did mention the case of Myanmar that you know he would he would want to advocate for a better better situation in Myanmar and then support you know any kind of reform and to, to turn Burma into a democratic again. So I hope that it would, it would not end up being lip service from Pita. Uh, well, I mean, I was told that. Uh, the, the new advisor on foreign policy for this current government would be uh, Kun Fuadi Piswan, who is a son of former uh, foreign minister of Thailand. So, and, and this guy has vision, so I hope that there could be something good coming out of this government in terms of foreign policy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Orin. Um, I've been a resident here in Sydney for over 30 years, and it's my first time here in this um, panel discussion. It's been very interesting. But anyway, my question tonight, I've just had that um, very interesting comment from Kun, if I pronounce your name correctly, Ganyana? Yeah, that's yes, great. thank you. Well, you just mentioned about the, um, you know, the process uh, of the election by post, uh, whatever. I, could you just um, perhaps share with us or anyone else around, you know, in the room or at home, how would you like to see that happen? I mean, what happened in the past, if it's good enough, or would you like to see it better, or is there anything else that we can improve? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So, um, so thanks for the question. Um, I believe if it's possible, because I think it's every, everything has been centralized in Sydney. So I have friends in Brisbane, in Melbourne, and they was asking, they would like to have the, um, to vote in person, to have a, some sort of a mobile unit in their area. But everyone else, if they want to vote in person, they have to fly in, to fly to Sydney. Or if to vote by post, many of us, were skeptical of the authentic, um, whether our ballots going to be um, going to be sent to Thailand just the way that we that we uh, uh, take from home. So that's that's that the transparency is, is in question here. So for me, the Thai authority has to make, uh, especially the royal consulate, the the Thai embassy, has to um, make us believe, uh, to make it, to, to put a trust, make people trust in them first, to in, in future. What I would like to see uh, here, because this year, we only have the mobile units in, in Sydney. Many of us flew from other states, from other towns, just to vote in person, because they, don't, they did not trust the vote by post. But many of us didn't have a choice, and they, they even though they didn't have a choice, and because of that, they didn't have a choice. They send the vote by post anyway. And um, for the process, the whole process, as I said, the transparency is in question. So in order to reduce um, you know, the questions from people, to put trust in us, um, I believe, if possible, I would like to see the mobile unit, not just in Sydney, could be in Melbourne, could be in Brisbane, um, or in, Cam and the, in Canberra as well. So there's another thing that I'm that I'm, I'm quite surprising. It's quite surprising for me to see that there's no mobile unit in Canberra. It's only in Sydney only. So um, so that's to to uh, I think we want to see transparency next time for the next election. And did you have any thoughts on? John Clark. Um, something that always interests me about authoritarianism and anti-authoritarianism in Thailand. I've been going to Thailand since 1976. Um, and that is the lack of a voice for the intellectual or artistic or, if you like, spiritual community, which you would find, which we have seen many historical examples of in recent years, 
in China, and unfortunately many of them are in prison, um, or in uh, Eastern Europe, some of those are now in prison. Um, and certainly um, some of them are nearly in prison, like Pamuk in Turkey. All of them in, in a situation where there's a very authoritarian regime with a closed circle between a certain section of the elite and uh, one could say the party in power, which in Thailand wears a certain color, as we're aware. Um, but we don't seem to see any of those heroic individuals standing up against the current in a verbal or a written or some other kind of public demonstration. Why do you think that is? Let's just start. Let me rephrase the question. Hi, John. It's about why we're not seeing more artists. Heroic. Oh, intellectual, intellectuals, artistic people as representatives of a spirit which is not being represented by the authoritarian powers that be. I actually kind of think that uh, maybe art takes on a different format, but the youth-led protests that started in 2020 had seen explosion of different kinds of creative arts in different spheres. So using art as a form of protest, using art as a way to... No, mistaking the problem. The problem is that, for example, the Soviet Union, the end of the Soviet Union after Brezhnev, we have Solzhenitsyn. Yeah. At the end of, nearly the end of the rule of Erdogan in Turkey, we have Pamuk and a lot of other people around them. We know who these people are, we know what their products are, we've seen them. I haven't seen them from Thailand. Like Krabta Yun? Yes, you could, might want to elevate him to that category, okay. But I wouldn't think there are very many. Okay. I see them. It's something, because Thailand, Thailand is such a literate society, mm -hmm. literacy for the last 30 years or so. I think it's had literacy for much longer than well, because maybe women were only only half, less than half the population of women were literate in 1970 when I was there. Um, so I want to know what it is about the way you are articulating the problems of authoritarianism in, in Thailand, which does not include and has not se does not seem to have produced any of these figures that we're very familiar with in these other countries. Maybe the structure is different, the history is different. We could always say that. There's something in Thailand which is stopping the election of significant, if you like, spiritual, if you like, artistic, if you like, literary figures to oppose this system. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but I'd like to, this is my take on your question. Um, we had one, uh, I would say, a, a poet uh, in the past. His name is uh, Jit Pumisa. So um, he, maybe he, he would came before the time. He came much earlier before his time. He was jailed and later on he died. And um, so what I see is in the entertainment industry in Thailand, they would take side with the winning, with the, what, what they, for them the clear winning. So they, they were kind of like hiding in a way. And if anyone who would like to stand out, they, they receive um, a lot of, uh, I think, very harsh repercussions and public sanction in a way. Um, so um, the per pe those that stood up, for example, those stood up with the Richards in the past, they um, receive cancel culture. I think we have cancel culture way before the, the Western. And for now, for for those that st stood with the dictatorship, for example, Ma On Da Pa or um, um, Sin Jai and those with the uh, blow the whistle, the whistleblowers uh, back when the uh, during the Kopopozo era. Sorry, I forgot the name, the terms in English. So for those that support dictatorship, I think they they receive their um, what they deserved by the, the cancel culture previously. But at this hour, I think the, the disruption of social media and how the entertainment has to struggle, has to survive in, 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 in the current um, stream, mainstream media no longer represent Thailand. People no longer watch TV. So it's quite hard to buy the artists who come out and support that we would say this is 
that, that they support our, our movement. We have some, actually, but they, they might not be called um, heroic or public figure that much that would, when you would call their name, everybody in the entire country would know. But um, to give you some example, we have Rap Against Dictatorship, we have um, um, Thai Tho Samit, and some other artists, it's more of an indie, independent, from the independent groups uh, and then underground music sectors, in a way. But for the mainstream media, I think, um, yeah, I, I can't, I can't uh, confidently call out names that they would support our movement. They, they're waiting for the clear winners first. I mean, it's a, sorry, it, I, sorry, sorry, I just, just quick intervention. I, I, I just want to put it this way. I think artists are just like any other profession in Thailand dominated by the conservative forces. Yeah. You can even say under royal patronage. Right? So that's why I mean you can go, you know, you talk about judges, you even you can even talk about professor in you in university. You have to behave in a certain way if you want to be prosperous in your career. And I think artists just like any other career in Thailand, you know, if you if you go with the, the conservative, right, then there's a chance for you to grow. But if you go, go against it, then of course we know we know the, the, the result. But but yeah, I have to say that you know uh, we, we might not see a lot, but we have seen some, especially during the let, let's say during the past ten years. You mentioned a uh, rap against dictator. I mean that is one one big phenomenon in Thailand. You know, given uh, the, the, the 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 total views of, of their of their YouTube uh, clip whatever, we have someone like Sir Abhishek Hong, who had done so brilliantly outside the royal patronage. And he dared to say it out loud, you know, in Khan, in this and that. And, and yeah, but, but, but they, these people do not want to be hero. You know why? Because being hero in Thailand, you should, you, you will be dead. So. <laughs> uh, the only thing I would say is that, is that um, this seems to be a reasonable amount of tolerance for critics, uh, for critical academics, for historians, um, that's not to say that some haven't um, had legal cases against them. So not upon Jai Jing, clearly his history, um, he's been in trouble with Les Majest. His supervisor, uh, Ajahn Guladar, has been in trouble because of a supervision of that particular individual. Um, but you're right, none are languishing in jail, um, even though they are quite critical. You could even talk about Ajahn Puang Tong, um, who's quite critical, but there seems to be the regime is reasonably tolerant or reasonably resistant or reasonably blasé about those people making those criticisms of the system, which they do quite um, quite strongly, but maybe, uh, you know, it's relatively rare that they have to flee the country, like our, our friend uh, Ajahn Bowin. Uh, but there's plenty that, that you know, um, have continued to criticise... Um, and, and we could also talk here about uh, Tong Chai, of course, um, who's been very strong uh, in his criticism and travels back and forth now, it appears. So it seems to be a choice, you know, um, Thailand's authoritarianism is not totalitarianism on the scale of China's yet. Uh, it's, um, is Pawin's TikTok the sole citizen of Thailand? Maybe it's not quite <laughs> that, but a day in the life of Bajan for wins TikTok. Please visit, please visit my TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Share up your day. <laughs> uh, I've only got a few minutes left. Any other questions? Can I ask a second? Sorry, right, I'll get that. An unfamiliar face for me. <laughs> yeah, being a Thai person, we always uh, anticipate the next coup. So uh, I would like to ask your opinion. Like, what would the next coup look like under the new reign? <laughs> <laughs> Who's starting? Yeah. I'm happy to, to add to that, given I have close family members who voted for the, the two uncles. Um, you know, like, these parties do. Are they uncle? No, they're not. <laughs> they're not my uncle, but they're very close family. My family's got everyone, like from the entire spectrum, and I think that should be something we talk more about. You know, living a with the differences, right, and loving the differences. Um, 
In fact, the total popular vote base for the for the um, constituencies anyway towards the conservative political establishment is still about 20% of the population. And recent previous coups in Thailand that have succeeded were the ones that have sufficient popular support. So I would never discount it because there's still clearly at least about 20% of um, voting population who uh, love the uncles and their friends. I remember that particular family member was like showing me online, you know, the, the shout out. So they're going around making sure, because they're older, so they're making sure that they tick the right box and tick the right number, because there's now two, and that's like their company is like, make sure you put your glasses on and write the right box. And I'm not trying to say that they're all older people, but the ones I know are all older people, you know? And I, and I, and, and, and I wrote, the, wrote my whole dissertation about the yellow shirts, and People who vote for political conservatives are not bad people at all, right? They, it's not that they don't understand that maybe the military shouldn't run politics. It's that, you know, they grew up in a time when that worked out for them, right? And I think to look at a country like Thailand and elsewhere, where you find people who support political parties who have clearly done bad things, the first question is why? You know, and it's not because they don't understand the difference between right and wrong, but it's that they could live with that reality because they've done it, and it's okay for them, it's done well for their families. And that change, the kind of change that Ganyana and the younger kids are talking about, scare them. They don't know, they don't understand. You know, they don't understand what the kids are talking about anyway, but they really don't understand, right? Um, so I wouldn't discount the possibility that what that coup would look like. And if it does happen, there will be people on the streets supporting them, handing them flowers like they've done. So, uh, yeah. There's been a theory floated that because Bangkok is so strongly orange this time, it really means that a coup is not viable, that coups don't happen contrary, contrary to the wishes of most people in Bangkok. But I think that theory's got big holes in it. I think if you look at the coup of 2006, that was against Thaksin's party and Thaksin's party had control of most of Bangkok, Thai Rak Thai at that time. So I'm not sure about that theory. I think another factor that has to be taken into account in any future coup is that the king himself is actually now a military force. Uh, he has control of um, two King's Card divisions plus his own Royal Security Command and there aren't any other army units in uh, metropolitan Bangkok. So whoever plans the coup better make sure that the king is behind it as well, which I think is a really interesting dynamic that hasn't been present in um, previous coup um, scenarios? I would answer from a different perspective from Ajahn uh, Craig. Uh, I think the new coup would be a little bit awkward. It, it would be a little bit awkward because uh, the last one was in 2014, that when Phu was still alive, even though bad written, yeah? What I'm trying to say is that coups prior to, I mean, any previous coup, you have Phu Phuong out there mostly legitimizing it. And he legitimizing it from the basis of his own moral authority and charisma. So that would make those who acceptable. But these future who, no, nowhere near. You know, we, we can talk about the difference between Wipon and Washington. The new king hasn't got what the father had, including moral authority. So, I mean... But, but, but Ajahn, can coups have been under a reign of fear instead of a reign of love? That could be. That's my chapter. <laughs> right. That would be, yeah. I mean, we talk about fear as a kind of royal governance uh, under Washington God. But, but, but if we want to focus specifically on the coup, yeah, that would be a big question of how the Thai, Thai people at large, you know, would interpret coup under the new reign when there is no royal, royal when there is no legitimate royal endorsement. And, and the legitimate, this is not from me. This is from what they think it was legitimate. But before we talk about coup, don't forget judicial coup. It could come before anything. 
So um, I just want to quickly say that um, another thing about our generation, we not we growing up watching, uh, we have much uh, better exposure to um, international. Um, Inf interna international affairs, I would say, and history. So, for example, we growing up watching a uh, Korean series, and the Korean series is really, um, I think, eye-opening, and they, they dare, they dare start conversations, that's something that we, we never talk about before, and I think it's bad, best timing when uh, The Crown, Netflix, um, The Crown season five came out, I'm not sure, season three, I'm not sure about the season, but there was, there was a time it was everywhere in Thailand because that scene, the queen was about to legalize the coup. Uh, someone, I think Lord Mountbatten, came to ask the queen, asking, uh, should we um, enact the coup, the coup, just to the coup? And she said, um, that's not my, my uh, essentially she said, it's not my place to do. If the people don't, do not let the people choose their government, it's not the king or the queen place to do that. And that, I think that, that, point out the uh, the elephant in the room that all the coup in the past in Thailand, it happened and it's successful because it was legitimized by the king. And that's the only time, that, that's only when the people, a lot of the younger generations realize that, well, so it's not about just the, the, hung, the hunger power um, of, of the military that they wanted to overturn the government. There's, there's power behind it. Um, and now that's why we're asking for the reform. So uh, for me, coup in this hour is out of a topic. And if they come out, we might see another Tiananmen or another youth movement that could be uh, the next South Korea. If they would like to, to, to see us come out. I, I believe this is at this hour, we, even at now. We 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 out. We like genie in the bottle that the professor has talked about it many times. We out of the bottle now. We realize our power, and we're not going to wait for for them to to dictate our future. So that's what we believe. That I believe that people my generation and the rest of us, not just my generation, everyone else that vote for change this time, we will make sure that we see change. Do we have time for one more, or is it? So the last, last one. How, one sec, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask the what panel's the opinion like um, today, how economic <laughs> and class issues express themselves in this election. Here we go. That's such a great question because economic issues were always the sort of fault lines before, right? It's the class-based analysis about, you know, the lower class, the middle class, the upper class, and all that. So where those go? Nowhere. They're still there, but they've become less salient in this election. The saliency in this election is really about the vision of change that you want, right, uh, status quo, political conservative, uh, or progressive and how progressive. So that's one fault line. And the other is really about whether you want minimal change or real structural change. But those class struggle, class-based struggles, inequalities, Gini coefficient still high, one of the highest still in Asia, those are all still there, completely unresolved. They just haven't been salient and that's reflected in the way that the major political parties have basically have very similar welfare policy, populist policy programs, that they're trying to pander to the voters, but now that had made all these parties' policies become indistinguishable. I think, I think it has been very, very convenient, you know, for a political party to pick on economic issues, right? You can't go wrong. We're talking about, you know, wanting a better, you know, livelihood for Thai. You, you, you can't just go wrong. And I think what I did brilliantly in the past, but I mean, time has changed, right? Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, e uh, economy is not, it's not important, but, but, but at this time, you know, at this critical juncture, let me put it that way, I think I think the new generation do not do not see economic issue immensely affecting them. It might affect them, yeah, but I think something more more important for them is basically uh, structural changes, 
and I mean it, it, for me it's not it's not one of them. Sorry, and I think this this might be a mistake of parties like Pure Thai, which continue to focus on on the economic issue. Yep, and that, that's why it's paved the way for Gao Kai to 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 to, to, to propose something new. I think the beginning of the election campaign, it really looked like it was going to be about those populist policies, the 12,000 baht policy, the minimum wage. You know, that was the basis that Pua Tai were going to get their landslide. But the closer we got to the election, it turned out, as Aim says, to be about something quite uh, much deeper, really, than, than simply um, cash handouts. But I think, I think when you talk about class, class struggle, I mean, some people might want to interpret, interpret it as, you know, having, having monarchy without reform. Mm. That is a crux, you know, of class struggle. Mm. That, could, that could be a way of explaining, especially, especially from the perspective of Gaokai Party, mm. which focuses mainly on, on this key issue rather than economic issue. Mm. And we, we, can, we can get away with, you know, talking about class struggle as sort of prominent also in this election. Question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's my friend. Okay. <laughs> so who's leaving? Right. Last one. Sorry, just a quick question. Um, so we've talked about the potential obst many obstacles ahead for the Move Forward Party. What's your opinion that they will be able to form a government and be and be uninterrupted? Or do you think for sure something's going to come up and it will derail? Uh, what's the likelihood of success for the Move Forward Party? Thai politics has no pair with, you know, roses, right? And uh, yeah, I, I, I would not, I would not imagine that it would, it would go uninterrupted. Right. And and they, they, they have to think about, uh, you know, obstacle coming that way. Uh, someone talked about, someone talked about deals. Right, deals now become a hot hot word in in, in Thai uh, in Thailand. Whether uh, even the cons conservative forces start might come up with their own deal in order to undermine uh, Pitan. So what I'm trying to say is that you know we, we should expect uh, some obstacles. So one thing we haven't spoken about is the fact that sorry uh, the Pitan's party and the coalition will undertake really serious military reform that we've never seen in Thai history. Um, they'll abolish conscription. They'll com probably completely redo uh, military education. I think that's a logical place to start. The military won't have experienced anything like what they're going to experience if, if, if move forward comes to power. So that means that they're cornered and, you know, you can imagine that they're going to be quite dangerous now that they're backed into a corner, so. Yeah. It's really difficult to bring structural change, but it's even more difficult to bring structural change in a coalition government. Because you're not just talking about one party, you're talking about six, seven, eight, right? And even though they sign MOU, the most important policies of MRP, none of their allies agree to. So I think with more than 300 policy promises of move forward and a very, you know, and a gra grass-based support that really wants something to happen, and Pitao being that kind of guy who's like, I want this to happen, I had a day, whatever, they need to bring some change. So they're, I think the most critical thing that they need to, to keep or try to fight for is the role of House Speaker. Because that House Speaker is giving the space for the discussion for the change to occur. And right now they're fighting it with Pua Thai. That tells you something about the coalition governing, right? They're fighting about the House Speaker role with their biggest and most needed ally. They both want it. In fact, we talk who just walk away, so I don't want to be I want House Speaker role, because if you've watched parliamentary sittings in the past, Kelly, um, am I the only one watching this thing? Um, this is where they get stopped. Every single time an MFP, MP want to table something, want to talk about something, want to keep on, this is the House Speaker role, held by Shonik Pai, right? 
Democrat Party, this is where the time stops, right? So in order to push change, you need space, and that space needs to be televised, and it happening, and they need that role. So I think their biggest hurdle is, is that, but also it shows you how difficult it is just to work in a coalition government. Malaysia know this very well. Uh, some of you are here, uh, Malaysian experts, it's really hard to get any change when you're running a coalition of that many parties. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we've run over time and over time again. Um, I appreciate the questions and, and all the answers. And thanks for the invitation.